As a follow-up to our just recently finished food and health survey webcast for health professionals, we had a few more questions to, to ask uh, that were asked of us, and, we're, and so uh, we're going to take time to answer them. One of the questions, uh, w and I'll, Liz, I'll put that, uh, pose this to you, is do you think that in the future consumers will become more wear wary or accepting of biotechnology? Thanks, Marianne. Well, I would definitely say that I anticipate them becoming more accepting. Um, I know, for one, in last year's uh, IFIC Foundation Food Tech Survey, we found that millennials and younger consumers often felt more positively about biotech and about its benefits. And I find that um, even, even the media in recent months, you've seen sort of a, a turn where the media has really caught up to the science and started standing up more and more for the, the benefits of biotech. And I think that, you know, over time, the, the science will win out. And I think that we'll see more and more uh, benefits of the technology. And the average consumer will see more of these benefits directly. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that will start to turn the tide a bit. Well, I think in our, in our research, not only in the food technology, but other people's research, we do see that consumers, when they can actually see that it, it's a, a personal benefit mm -hmm. or especially a mm -hmm. health benefit to them, then they see that they're actually a value. In fact, I Definitely. did a panel of a couple months ago, and, and a, a woman from the Pew Charitable Trust said even uh, is connecting is that she was one of the ones that said, you know, because of having different type of oils, I now can control my inherent elevated cholesterol level. Exactly, you know, yeah. it's a genetic issue that, uh, uh, but this is this will help. So I do think if we can connect you know, health benefits with, with technology, people see that there are values. Definitely, and even in our in our survey that we just presented, we saw that two-thirds agreed with the statement that nutritional content was more important than whether or not the food was produced using biotechnology. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely speaks to your point. One question that came in said, uh, could we explain a little bit about the food labeling law to go into effect later this year, and is this expected to change consumer behavior in any way? Um, you mentioned it in one of your questions, Sarah, mm -hmm. maybe just to explain what type of food labeling laws we were talking about. Yes, yes. Um, I was referring to the menu labeling law that will be implemented later this year that will be requiring calories on the menus for all restaurants that have at least 20 um, operations. So. Um, to be determined whether or not this will affect um, consumer perceptions and behavior, but we did see in our survey this year that most of the Americans are saying that they're occasionally looking at this nutrition information now, so um, we'll see what happens when it's implemented later this year. And does looking at it actually change behavior? Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, they've done some interesting studies, you know, looking at receipts from places. So I think the, the evidence is kind of mixed right now, but it'll be interesting to see going forward what that does. Yeah, and I think no matter what, it's going to require additional education around any um, policy that's implemented. Um, you know, I think we will still need to do our jobs as health professionals to make sure that the messages um, get out there on, on what a calorie is, which, you know, and variety of foods and things like that to make sure that people are understanding what they're reading on these menus. Yeah, one interesting I mentioned from the some of the studies they've done and just recalling from memory, you know, some some have shown calorie reductions in orders that weren't for themselves, right. you know, for their children, let's yeah. say. But when they're making choices for themselves, the story's not quite the same. Right. right. Yeah. And we know, especially eating out, sometimes people look at that as an occasion, a special occasion rather than routine. Right. And and sometimes nutrition guidelines don't really fall into place when, when making those choices. So I agree. It, it's really it, uh, wait to be seen. One other question uh, mentioned was, are the new nutritional guidelines, I'm assuming they're talking about the dietary guidelines, that just came out expected to change consumer beliefs, i.e. cause people to be less concerned about cholesterol and our caffeine intake. So this is in reference to, of course, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommendations. We know that these aren't set guidelines at this point and won't really see those until uh, the end of the year. but. I pose that question to any of you um, where you think this, uh, the recommendations or at least um, might affect consumer behavior. I can take a first crack at that. I mean, there is that concern, you know, of course, when, you, when you're making such a, I guess, it's not necessarily scientifically a bold statement because we've known for quite some time now that the effect of cholesterol from food doesn't directly relate to cholesterol in blood, but consumers haven't necessarily heard that quite as much. So to the extent they take that guidance and see it as a uh, license to consume more, I don't know. 
Uh, we saw some of those maybe similar things with um, the call to reduce fat or avoid fat in your diet. People saw a license to eat more low-fat foods or non-fat foods. Uh, so there is there is that concern, but I think that it's pro it's a step in the positive direction because that's where the science is, is leading us. So it's our job as health professionals to help get those messages from the scientific community out to the consumer. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I think, as I said before, I think the communication part of any of these policies, the dietary guidelines, and any other thing, um, will be critical in making sure that um, Americans understand what this, these guidelines mean. So, and as you said, it remains to be seen what's going to be actually in, in the report that comes out, but um, we need to make sure that we're staying on top of making sure that Americans understand what all of these guidelines mean and how to in in incorporate those into their life. It was also mentioned caffeine, uh, and you, you mentioned some findings from caffeine, Liz, mm -hmm. and of course there seems to be a lot in the news recently about caffeine. So. Any, any insights or thoughts in regards to the caffeine? Well, I think that definitely you do see that the that more Americans are at least strongly agreeing with the statement that they know what caffeine, how, how much caffeine they consume. And I think it was a little bit over half. So there's still an education opportunity um, for us health professionals to really, you know, show Americans how they can, you know, keep track of their caffeine intake. But a lot of research is showing us that overall Americans are, you know, consuming a, a pretty moderate, amount of caffeine and so it's not um so it's you know the dietary guidelines shouldn't necessarily change too much i think americans approach to caffeine control or consumption but it's on us to to help show them how to keep track of their daily intake and i think it goes back to what we said throughout the uh, webcast it really is making sure that we give positive sim simple and actionable mm -hmm. uh, uh, messages because you know as we as we see in our in our survey people want to know what to eat but at the same time and I know just from my years when I actually did some counseling it was like just tell me what to eat yeah. and so the reality is that if you give them a, a guideline then I think some of the questions will, will they will they follow it well they will if they have a better guidance on what you know what does 200 milligrams mm -hmm. mean what does 400 milligrams mean because mm -hmm. throwing out numbers without quantifying it with food does become yeah, confusing. Definitely. Well, that was a discussion in the committee uh, DGAC meetings was, you know, coffee and caffeine. So, you know, where they landed on the evidence for, for coffee was beneficial. Was mm -hmm. that due to the caffeine content or not? Um, I, I can't recall exactly what they said at that point, but, um, you know, advising people to consume uh, coffee to get that caffeine as long as it's not over, you know, 400 milligrams yeah. or whatever the recommendation is, is um, one way, one place to start. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one final question that really kind of changes uh, our, uh, our, our, our conversation. And this was just a question about uh, the, a no pesticides. And, and of course, when we ask, uh, we ask several of those if they would buy, in the, you know, if they would buy products, if they were labeled local or whatever. And this just uh, question said, is no pesticides a positive or negative claim? I would just say that I suppose in many cases it, it really depends on who, you know, who 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 is is viewing that, and 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 uh, in many cases I think um, that the know this and know that uh, people might feel like it, it it is a positive, but in some of our consumer research we've found that sometimes uh, putting a a no whatever on a um, on the food gives them an automatic concern whether without even knowing if mm -hmm. that's a, a true mm -hmm. a true health concern Definitely. or not. Definitely. And, and I mean, we find that, you know, no pesticides, I think that that leads to a lot of confusion about consumers because, you know, it's, it's implying that there is something that they need to be wary of when, in fact, you know, levels of pesticide residues on, uh, on produce fall well below the, you know, EPA uh, tolerances that they set out. So really, I mean, I think that that's a that just highlights maybe a perceived risk rather than an actual risk for people. And I think that as health professionals, we really help, have to help um, our clients and our patients understand the difference between um, a perceived risk r rather than an actual risk. And we see that a lot in some of our, our food safety data that we'll go over in September. And which is a good segue to yeah. say, save too soon for more insights <laughs> yeah. on that. But I do think that also it really talks about in, in this regard, the risk and benefits you know, is it more of a risk uh, not consuming, i.e. fruits and vegetables, versus 
being concerned that mm -hmm. it might have uh, a very low level of pesticides and so that's yeah. where we have to put that into perspective. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and also what the function of those ingredients are in our food. So whether it's no pesticides, no preservatives, whatever that um, that label says, make sure that consumers understand that there's a reason why these ingredients are in our food and um, they serve a function and um, they're safe and effective for ver various reasons. So making sure that consumers have the, the whole picture rather than that one little snapshot on a label. And, and um, Chris, you mentioned uh, about coconut uh, coconut oil and we know that it's been in the in the news and of course we asked uh, insights about it the first time this year and so you know what's you know what what's your recommendation or, or rec uh, about coconut oil I mean is it um, I know we've done some fact sheets in regards to the use or non-use non-use of the oil yeah that's a good plug we've, we've got a nifty <laughs> little fact sheet if you want to know more about it check out our website find that uh, we also have a pretty cool new infographic that, that breaks down what's in that fact sheet for you know in a little bit less scientific language. I think the I think some of the emerging consumer trend has to do with its MCT content, um, but what you'll find if you read the fact sheet is that those beneficial MCTs are actually pretty um, uh, they appear in pretty small quantities in coconut oil. So there's this aura about it having some you know beneficial health properties or you know curing halo, yeah perhaps. some halo around curing certain diseases possibly if you go online you can see what they talk about um, I wouldn't say to avoid it though I mean it's it's something that can be used in small quantities and in moderation um, y you know it's it's it has a high saturated fat content but that doesn't mean that it should just be you know completely off limits mm -hmm. to people it does impart good flavor on foods uh, particularly in stir fries or you know the, um, cooking of that nature yeah, but Thai food Thai is, food, yeah, yeah but um, you know I don't personally use it I don't have it in my <laughs> stable but um, I don't think there's any reason to avoid it it's just kind of like I said before sort of tempering the the discussions out there about what it's uh, gonna cure yeah and making sure that the other important healthful oils don't get forgotten at the same time so making right. sure that olive oil is still um, a, a really great oil to use with healthy fats um, and other oils as well, soybean oil, canola oil. So making sure that all of those are available to consumers and that they, they should be using them all, but um, you know, in, in small quantities for each one. Right, and that, I mean, that's a good point because I mentioned the high saturated fat content of coconut oil, whereas a lot of the other oils have good blends, mixes of omega-3s, omega-6s, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, which with coconut oil you're not necessarily getting the, the way you would with using other oils. Right. Well, thanks all of you, and thanks for your additional questions. And you can always find more information on many of these topics we just uh, talked about and more by going to our website at foodinsight.org. You can find a lot of great uh, fact sheets, uh, blogs, and infographics that can provide a lot of valuable information, not only for you as, as the health professional, but as the consumer as well. Thank you.